once we accept this inverse gambler's fallacy charge, and obviously, as you say, it's all debatable, but once you do, you need to go for the homogenous version of eternal inflation if you're going to go for eternal inflation. Why is that? Well, as I said, th this is all rooted in this requirement of total evidence, this important principle of probabilistic reasoning that you need to work, you're obliged to work with the most specific evidence you have. In this ballpark, the most specific evidence is that this universe is fine-tuned. Welcome to Closer to Truth. I'm speaking with philosopher Philip Goff about his important and provocative new book, Why? The Purpose of the Universe. Philip is a philosophy professor at Durham University in the UK, trying to work out the ultimate nature of reality, especially consciousness. Philip co-hosts the Mind Chat podcast. Philip, I've been a great fan of your work, and it's uh, really good to finally meet on Closer to Truth. Oh, that's really lovely to hear, Robert. Well, I've watched and enjoyed very many Closer to Truth videos, so it's lovely to hear that you've followed some of my work too. A absolutely, and and congrats on the book, uh, Why the Purpose of the Universe. I, I really loved it. I don't necessarily agree with all of it, as you'd expect, but but really love it. Now, I know a whole bunch of theistic philosophers and atheistic philosophers who disagree viscerally with the thesis of your book, uh, though they, I'm sure, like you personally. Uh, not to mention a whole bunch of materialist physicists who also disagree. How did you manage to alienate all three groups with one shot? Yeah, this is the problem when you don't fit into one of the well-established teams. Everyone hates me now. Um, yeah, I mean, you're totally right that I think everyone feels they have to fit into this dichotomy of, uh, you know, do you believe in the God of traditional religion or are you a secular atheist? It's like, whose side are you on, Richard Dawkins or the Pope? And um, <laughs> I guess for a long time I, w I was raised Catholic, actually, but I decided I didn't believe in God when I was about 14. And uh, that was the end of that. And for a long time I was in team secular atheist. But just slowly over a long period of time, I've just come to think that both of these worldviews are inadequate, that both of them have things they can't explain about reality. And this has been very uncomfortable for me in a way. I feel a bit silly defending some of these things I'm defending, but I've just followed where the evidence seems to lead to me and ended up with this strange book that pleases nobody. <laughs> so we're going to explore it in depth. And what I want to do is start with your conclusion, the overall thesis, and then we'll go through the logical structure and flow of your arguments point by point in, in some detail. So what's the overarching thesis of why the purpose of the universe, a very uh, uh, ambitious, shall we say, uh, <laughs> idea? Yeah, I don't go for modesty. Um, it's a defense of cosmic purpose, by which I simply mean the idea that there is some kind of fundamental goal-directedness at the basic level of reality. Sometimes people call this teleology, the word telos being the, the Greek word for purpose. Um, so for many people who think there's a purpose to the universe, there's a reason why it exists, they will associate that with the god of traditional Western religion. I don't think that's a good idea either, though, uh, for familiar reasons. I think it's so hard to reconcile a loving God with the terrible, gratuitous suffering we find in the world. So there's, so there's things that the, the God hypothesis can't explain, the suffering we find in the world, the, the uselessness of much of the universe, perhaps. But I think there's also things, the traditional secular atheist view that we live in a meaningless, purposeless universe, there's things that that view can't explain either, such as the fine tuning in physics for life, the surprising discovery in recent decades that for life to be possible, certain numbers in physics had to fall in a quite narrow range. Um, so that's one thing I focus on. Also, facts about the evolution and emergence of consciousness that I think are quite hard to explain in traditional Darwinian terms, although I do think ultimately 
we can give an evolutionary explanation, but I think we need to join that with some kind of conception of cosmic purpose. So basically, it's a middle way. It's, it's, I'm arguing for the inadequacy of the God of traditional religion on the one hand, secular atheism on the other, and exploring the much neglected middle ground. And I, I consider a range of hypotheses that we can perhaps get into without, without settling on, on, on any in particular. Um, and then, and then ultimately, so most of, most of the book is just arguing for the, on philosophical and scientific grounds for the reality of cosmic purpose. But then in the final chapter, I ask, what does this mean for human existence, for human meaning, for human purpose, and try and fit them together? Okay, that's, uh, that's a great overview. And, um, and as I see it, there are two uh, um, foundational uh, uh, analytic philosophy or scientific uh, premises on which the book is based. One is fine tuning, uh, which is a question in physics and cosmology, which we'll get into. And the other is your approach to consciousness, a, a non-materialistic, non-physicalist, that there has to be something. Uh, you're one of the uh, famous uh, panpsychists in terms of, and we'll get into that in detail. So those are the two kind of scientific thing, uh, uh, aspects or analytical philosophy um, uh, pillars to your idea. And then, and then the concept of purpose the way I see the book working is you have this um, initial sense that there is a purpose. And so in a sense, you're driving to that goal in your own teleological um, methodology. But then those two elements, the fine tuning and the nature of consciousness uh, 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 supports that there is purpose. So purpose is sort of a, a goal to begin with, but you're not sure. But then these two foundational ideas lead to that. Is that, is that fair? I would say maybe a, a little bit different to that. I would say that I, the reason I believe in cosmic purpose or think there's a very good case for cosmic purpose is because of those two foundational planks, because without cosmic purpose, we can't account for the fine tuning in physics and the emergence of conscious understanding. So, yeah, this is a purely, it's not that I have some, I was quite happy not believing in cosmic purpose. Okay. Uh, it, I have no sort of deep need to do that. I was just, in, in a way, as I say, this is quite uncomfortable for me. I've sort of been dragged kicking and screaming into, into believing in, in cosmic purpose. One of our challenges then will be to see, even given these two ideas, which we'll explore, and of course, they're both controversial, um, given those ideas, why purpose emerges from that. Um, and so we'll, we'll get into that as well. So I just want to give the overview to begin with. So now let's deal with each of the, those main pillars in, in some depth. Uh, and the first and really where you start, um, chap, name of your chapter is why science points to purpose. And this is basically a discussion of fine tuning, uh, which, um, we can describe and, we have tracked that for on closer to truth as one of our leap motifs or core themes for two decades or more. So we've had dozens of videos with the uh, leading physicists, uh, mainly, uh, on, on the topic, um, in terms of the, um, constants, uh, 26 constants in, in the standard model or lots of issues in cosmology where you can't have much deviation in any one of them in order to have structure at all in the universe. You could have immediate collapse the black holes or an, an expansion without ever having any uh, galactic and, and stellar and planetary structure uh, by very fine difference. But one of the challenges is by people who challenge the nature of fine tuning is that the, the, the concept of the variability of, uh, and, and, and tolerance for each individual, um, uh, parameter. Uh, can be mitigated significantly by simultaneously modifying more than one. So the fallacy that said against the fine tuning argument that there is fine tuning is that you're only modifying one. But if you, if you have, if you're able to modify, you know, 26 or however many different dials at the same time, you can get many uh, kinds of structures that can work. I mean, it's of course true we haven't tried out all possible combinations of all the different constants um, that would take an infinite amount of time to do. 
But it's a bit of a myth, I think, that this has only been tried with one constant at a time. There are lots of papers published trying various combinations of the constants and mapping out a kind of probability space. Um, and as insofar as we've explored such probability spaces, the the range of life permitting values does seem to be fairly narrow. Now, some people say, well, you know, we, we haven't finished. We've got to keep going. Maybe that'll change tomorrow. And of course, that's true. Right. And and I think this is this is part of what you often find with fine tuning. I feel like people ramp up the standards of evidence in this one case. So it's almost like, oh, well, we haven't completed physics yet. So how do we know there's fine tuning? We haven't brought quantum mechanics and general relativity together. Now, that's true. But and it's possible. It's possible that when we bring quantum mechanics and general relativity together, the fine tuning problem will go away. It's also possible we'll find in that new theory, there's more fine tuning. So all you can ever do is work with the evidence you have now. Um, explore in, in a sort of unbiased way and in a way that's not cooking the books, explore as many combinations as you can. And insofar as we've done that, the life permitting range does seem to be fairly narrow in most of these cases. I, I would, it's certainly fair to say that a majority of physicists would agree with that, but certainly not a, um, uh, a consensus or, or a complete agreement on that for the various reasons. People say life can be in different forms. So there are different ways the constants work. One is for life, one is for just structure in general. Uh, but certainly let's, let's, let's give us that. Let's give us the fine tuning right now with an asterisk that says that uh, not all physicists agree with that, although a majority do. So we're going to assume that and, and move on. Now, the typical answer, of course, as you know, as you deal with extensively, is the, the multiverse, that um, if uh, there are a, a huge innumerable number, indeed, if there are an infinite number of uh, of universes, each with its own set of laws scrambled so that they're all different. Uh, everything that is possible becomes inevitable, uh, including a universe that would have us. Uh, now, you attack this view with the what you call the inverse gambler's fallacy. So tell us how that works. Just can I just say something on the consensus of, of scientists? I, I mean, I'm not a physicist myself, but insofar as I've tried to look at the papers published on this, there doesn't seem to be many physicists who have actually dug deep into the, the work and shown that, you know, there is no fine tuning. It's all a load of nonsense. There might be disagreement around the edges. If you look at Sean Carroll's debate with William Lane Craig, for example, there's, you know, disagreement around the edges, but, um, in terms of something like just the cosmological constant, the um, rate of the acceleration of, of the expansion of the universe, whereby if that if it had been a little bit stronger, no two particles would have ever met. Uh, we would have had no stars, planets, no structural complexity at all. Whereas if that had been a little bit weaker, uh, everything, as you say, would have collapsed back on itself um, in the first split second of the Big Bang. I, I haven't come across, to be honest, and maybe I just haven't looked a great deal of disagreement with that particular case. And what's interesting about it is it doesn't seem to be something to do with all oh, the particular type of life we're made of. It's it's to do with the possibility of any kind of structural complexity right. in the, the universe. Most, that's the most fundamental, to be sure. We're going to give us that. I, 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 I'm, I'm with you on it. That's 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 our view, too. I just like to represent the, the potential other side with a little asterisk. That's it. Absolutely. OK, on to the multiverse. Yeah. So this is certainly the most important objection. And this is what I used to go for. I've, I've always thought the fine tuning needs explaining. But for a long time, I thought, well, the, the multiverse seems like the better option. What's changed my mind is long conversations with philosophers of probability that has just persuaded me that there's some dodgy reasoning going on here, some fallacious reasoning in the inference from fine tuning to a multiverse. And this is one of the things I'm excited about with the book, actually, because this is something that's been in the techie philosophy journals for decades. 
And yet nobody knows it. In a typical case of academics talking to themselves, nobody knows about it outside of academic philosophy, despite huge interest in fine tuning among physicists, among theists, audience of this show. So I'm really excited to, to get this, this argument out to a broader audience. So the charge is that the multiverse theorist commits what's called the inverse gambler's fallacy. So this could, can get technical, but there's a nice analogy to set it up. So suppose, Robert, you and I go to a casino later tonight, and the, we go in and the first thing we see is some person having an incredible run of luck in the first room, just winning on the roulette wheel again and again and again, making millions of dollars. And a nice turn to you and I say, wow, the casino must be really full tonight. Mm -hmm. And you say, what are you talking about, Philip? What you, we just seen this one guy winning big. What's the, we haven't seen the other rooms in the casino. And I say, well, if, if there's a, a huge number of people playing roulette in the casino tonight, if there's maybe trillions, then it's not so surprising that someone is going to have a great run of luck. And that's what we've just observed, someone having a great run of luck. Now, everybody agrees that's a fallacy, right? Because our, our observational evidence is, is this one person. That's our observational evidence. Let's call this person Sarah. Sarah's had an incredible run of luck. No matter how many people are elsewhere in the casino, it has no bearing on how likely it is that this one person we've observed is going to win big. But that looks like, to my mind, is the exact same form of reasoning of the multiverse theorist, right? They start from this observation. Oh, my God, the numbers came up right for life very improbably in our universe. There must be lots of other universes out there with terrible numbers. But that's the same fallacy because our observational evidence is this, this one universe we've observed. Uh, what we need an explanation of is why its numbers are fine-tuned for life. No matter how many universes there are out there, it doesn't, it doesn't raise the probability of our evidence, of our observational evidence that this universe has the right numbers for life. That's the S, that's the starting point. It's inverse in a sense because the normal way you think about it is somebody doing a roulette wheel and they get a, a hundred reds in a row. They said, wow, now I'm going to bet on black because the odds are much higher. And obviously the odds are the same every single time. Uh, and this is, this is flipping it around. So that, that, that's entirely correct. Now, the next stage in the argument, counter argument, brings in anthropic selection. Because why are we not talking in the middle of the sun, um, just as likely as on the surface of the earth? Well, we couldn't exist there. The only place we'd exist is here, uh, as far as we know. So this is the anthropic selection effect that w we can only ask the question because we're in that process of, of seeing it. Uh, you deal with that with a, with, with, with a, with a cute approach. So how do you bat that one away? Well... There's, there's two ways I can answer this. One is with getting into the technical underpinnings. Another is working again with the analogy. M maybe I could just do both of them. Just So what is going on at the core of this, I think, is quite well understood. It's rooted in a very important principle in probabilistic reasoning known as the requirement of total evidence. And this is quite simply the principle that we always need to work with the most specific evidence we have. So a nice example, um, suppose Jack has been accused of murder and the prosecution say to the jury, Jack always carries a knife around with him. Now, th the truth of the matter, as the prosecution well know, is that Jack carries a butter knife around with him, right? But the prosecution don't reveal that. Now, I think we can agree the prosecution has misled the jury, but they haven't told a lie. He does carry a knife around him, round with him. They just haven't told the most specific evidence they have, namely that it's a butter knife he carries around with him. So this is a very important and well well accepted principle. It's exactly that principle that the multiverse theorist violates. Because look, there's two ways of construing the evidence of fine tuning. We could construe it as our universe is fine tuned. Or we could construe it as this universe is fine-tuned. But the, the requirement of total evidence re impels us 
to work with the more specific way of construing the evidence, which is that this universe is fine tuned. And that's exactly what's going on in the casino case. It's true, actually, that, that, you know, we know that someone in the universe, someone in the casino has had an incredible run of luck. But that's not our most specific evidence. Our most specific evidence is this particular person. And we're obliged by this well-accepted principle to work with the most specific evidence we have. Now, so and just to work in the, with the analogy, you could say, OK, the, but the, what about what about this anthropic anthropic effect? What about this anthropic effect? Well, we can just add a kind of artificial anthropic effect to my example. So suppose, unbeknownst to us, as we walked in, there was a sniper hiding out at the back of the casino waiting to kill us unless the, per the first person we see has an incredible run of luck. Shoot us dead before we see anything. Well, and now in the setup, there was no chance that we could have observed anything other than someone having an incredible run of luck. But still, I think everyone would agree that this is a fallacy. The fact that, you know, someone was about to shoot us is neither here nor there. That doesn't remove the fallacy, the inverse gambler's fallacy. So, so yeah, I don't think the, the selection effect works. Okay. I, I think this is a very legitimate um, argument on, I, I think both sides have a point. I think you have brought a, uh, a sophisticated way of understanding this, which I think is a, is a great contribution. However, uh, so I want to go to the next step, though, because it seems in our discussion we've had so far as if the multiverse was um, was uh, uh, constructed in order to deal with the fine tuning problem in a non theistic way. In fact, many people assume that that uh, physicists don't like a theistic explanation to the fine tuning argument that there was a designer who designed all these things, turning the knobs. Uh, so they came up with the multiverse, when in fact, that's exactly what not happened. Uh, what happened was the multiverse was uh, motivated by the laws of physics, particularly from uh, initially from cosmic inflation theory, which were, came about for totally other reasons to deal with uh, uh, the, the, the various characteristics of the universe that couldn't be explained without. Now, that's also a little bit controversial cosmic inflation theory, but that is the standard model right now of uh, of cosmology. And the the natural derivative, what comes out of inflation theory, wasn't why they created in, created inflationary to solve problems of how the universe looked. Uh, and But what came out of that was the multiverse, because inflation, if you have it, couldn't be stopped. In fact, that was an early problem of, of inflation. Then string theory came along and there were different so-called 10 to the 500 different structures and string theory that could lead to different multiverses. And so all of those came out of physics. And then, um, then th the fact that the multiverse existed, then it was used uh, 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 again. It just happened to also solve in their minds the fine tuning problem, but it didn't come about in order to solve the fine tuning problem. It came about for other reasons, which are certainly debatable, but is the standard model. And then fine tuning happened to be solved by it as an ancillary benefit. Good. Well, this is another thing I'm excited about with the book, because not only have philosophers discussing this inverse gambler's fallacy problem for the multiverse, not only have they not talked to people outside of academic philosophy, but I've never come across a paper that connects it to the science and connects it to the most popular scientific version of the multiverse that you've just so eloquently laid out there. And that's what I try to do in, in the book. So, so here's, here's what I think. And it's, so it's a good job. I said a little bit about the technical underpinnings. So, so th this is often called eternal inflation, what you've just laid out. So there's the idea that there's, this sort of mega universe in which inflation never ends. It's always exponentially expanding, but then various sub regions of it slow down to form what are sometimes called bubble universes in their own right. And the idea is we're one of those universes. But now you, you could have t two versions of eternal inflation. You could have an, a version of eternal inflation where all of the bubble universes have the same local physics. They're all fine tuned for life. I call that homogenous eternal inflation. Now, of course, nobody goes for that. Nobody goes for that. They go for what we might call 
heterogeneous. I'm not sure where you should say heterogeneous or heterogeneous. I'll say heterogeneous. Heterogeneous uh, eternal inflation where each of the bubble universes has different numbers in its physics. And as you say, string theory helps us make sense of of how we could do that. Now, my, 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 and you know, if you're going to account for fine tuning, obviously you need to go for the second one. You need to go for heterogeneous eternal inflation, where there's great variety in the numbers of in physics in the different bubble universes. My contention is that once we accept this inverse gambler's fallacy charge, and obviously, as you say, it's all debatable, but once you do, you need to go for the homogenous version of eternal inflation if you're going to go for eternal inflation. Why is that? Well, as I said, th this is all rooted in this requirement of total evidence, this important principle of probabilistic reasoning that you need to work, you're obliged to work with the most specific evidence you have. In this ballpark, the most specific evidence is that this universe is fine-tuned. Now, if you go for the more standard heterogeneous eternal inflation where, where each of the bubble universes has different local physics and the numbers are set by probabilistic processes, then it's incredibly unlikely that this universe would be fine-tuned. Maybe it's likely that our universe would be fine-tuned, but it's incredibly unlikely that this universe would be fine-tuned. So we don't get a good account of our actual specific evidence. Whereas if you go for um, homogeneous eternal inflation in conjunction with some kind of cosmic purpose view, maybe we could get onto the specifics of that later, then you do make it incredibly likely that, um, that our universe is fine-tuned. So as long as we're working with that evidence that this universe is fine-tuned, then I, I, I think, um, I think we, we can go for eternal inflation, fine, but we've got to think that most or all of the universe is defined. Okay, well, so that's that's an important point that uh, the difference between uh, a homogeneity in terms of the laws of physics or heterogeneity in different universes that that's a point, and you and you say that by needing to deal with the current evidence, you would skew to the homogeneity of that, and I think that's a fair philosophical point. Um, I would say most or many physicists would go to the other side based not on philosophical argument but but what they believe that the standard model and string theory have to say but let's let's leave it at that because we're not going to solve it i i do want to go to the next point which is what you brought up is that uh going from fine tuning so now at each stage we're you know i'm giving some objections you're answering them we're we're saying okay we understand the situation we're giving you the the benefit of that answer so we can continue with your argument uh, and the arc and flow of your argument. And so now we're giving fine tuning and we're giving fine tuning in, in a way that in, in a homogeneity sense. So we really have a fine tuning. Uh, we really have fine tuning uh, with all the asterisks I put in the past. Uh, OK, now I want to why does that lead to purpose? And the reason I'm asking is that generally when when we deal with fine tuning, even when you accept it, there are three or four maximum possibilities. There's the concept of necessity that when, as we talked about before, the laws of physics are finally finalized with quantum physics, general relativity, string theory, whatever it's going to be at the most fundamental level, we'll discover, ah, there couldn't be any other way. It's necessity. Now, that used to be a theory. It, most physicists do not think that's possible. That's why they go to the second one, which is chance, the multiverse, the selection principle, et cetera. And of course, the third one is design, which, which theists use, of course, but it can be lots of different kinds of design, simulation argument, various other kinds of things. Um, but I, with those three, I, I don't necessarily see how you get from fine tuning to purpose. Yeah, it's really nice to, to lay out the options that way. Uh, on necessity, I think this might, at least in part, connect to the issue we've already discussed of you have to work with the evidence that you have. So maybe future physics will turn up and show us actually these numbers are all necessitated by some deeper theory. And in the deeper theory, the fine tuning worry goes away. Maybe. Or maybe we'll just get more fine tuning. So all you can ever do is work with what you've got. And physics at the moment looks like these numbers, there's no no rhyme or reason for them. 
And therefore, I think it's natural to and needed to look to other explanations. I mean, on chance, I mean, I think it's it's okay to accept things as flukes if they're a little bit improbable, but, you know, not wildly improbable. I give the example in the book of Jesus in toast. You know, sometimes <laughs> the burn mark on the toast looks spookily like Jesus, or at least Jesus as represented in Western art. Um, and, you know, we like that because it's always a bit improbable, but it's not that improbable. Uh, whereas the kind of improbability we're talking about in fine tuning is just crazy improbable. So, I mean, you know, to take a different analogy, if some bank robbers break into a bank and they try the uh, combination lock, six, six number combination, and they get all the numbers right, right? We'd never say, oh, well, maybe they just fluked it, right? No, that's too improbable. So I think once you get to these kind of crazy improbabilities, I just think it's not rational to accept it's just chance and coincidence. So I think fundamentally we're left with a dilemma. Either it's just an absolutely incredible fluke, and I think that's too improbable to take seriously, or the numbers in our physics are as they are because they are the right numbers for life. In other words, that there's some kind of directedness towards life at the fundamental level of reality. Now, God is one, or God or design is one way of making sense of that. If there's a supernatural designer who wanted life and fixed the numbers to get life, that's one way of making sense of goal directedness towards life. But it's not necessarily the only way. So I think we need to consider more, more options in that. Okay. I, and I think that's, that's very good. Uh, and you lead to purpose. And I think there ne then needs to be other parts of the argument that, that lead to that. But what you've done is you've shown how fine tuning can allow purpose as a potential way. You've skewed to the third explanation, which is that it is not chance and it's not necessity. So there has to be something there. You're broadening the term traditionally design or designer. Uh, to the concept of teleology or purpose, uh, which would subsume the, the God hypothesis or the simulation hypothesis uh, as well, uh, but allows broader um, uh, uh, explanations of what that purpose is. And that's what the rest of your, your book and your thesis and your background in, in panpsychism does. So let's now proceed as you do in the book. Uh, the next uh, concept after fine tuning, which was again critical, uh, is the nature of consciousness. And this is the product of your previous book, uh, Galileo's era uh, uh, toward a, a new science of consciousness. Um, and uh, you deal with the concept of panpsychism. But let's just roll this back in terms of the importance of consciousness within the context of, of purpose. So in this context, um, dealing with with uh, with uh, the the concept of how consciousness helps your argument why fine tuning leads to purpose. So consciousness is the next key node in this argument. So give me a, a quick sense of overview of how that works, uh, and I particularly like the idea of uh, uh, how you deal with the concept of weak and strong emergence um, as a uh, potential argument against uh what your what your theories are because that's a typical uh physicalist approach this this is the most challenging part of the book i, I it comes with a little warning at the start that the issues here are, are more technical and challenging perhaps a good starting point is i think there's a real under underexplored challenge making sense of how and why consciousness evolved and the reason is that natural selection is only interested in behavior because it's only behavior that's important for survival. Now, as we've had incredible developments, progress in AI and robotics, it's become apparent, I think, that you can have very complicated information processing, very complicated behavior without any inner conscious life at all. And it, it then becomes conceivable that natural selection could have constructed what we might call survival mechanisms, very, very complicated mechanisms that mechanically track features of their environment and initiate mechanical responses that are highly survival conducive. 
but where there's no inner life or experience at all. And they, it seems on the face of it, they could have survived just as well as us. So the question is, why aren't we survival mechanisms? Why did, why, why did natural selection bother giving us this wonderful inner life rather than just making us mechanisms that survive well? And I think there's obviously a lot of steps in this argument, but I think the only solution to that is that when we get organisms that are not just mechanically responding to the world, but which have conscious understanding of it and the ability to freely respond on the basis of that conscious understanding in very rudimentary forms at first and then more complex. As this starts to happen, it opens up radically new forms of behavior to what you get just from a mechanism and forms of behavior that are much more conducive to survival than anything you could get just with a mechanically responding. And so the natural selection, as it were, and personifying natural selection a bit here, um, observes this and, and th thinks, I want a bit of that. It's gonna be, natural selection thinks, it's gonna be easier for me to get organisms that can survive well if I give them conscious understanding and free will, conscious understanding of the world around them and the ability to freely respond on the basis of that understanding. They're gonna rationally understand the world and rationally respond to it. They're gonna survive much better, or it's much easier at least to get something that can survive well on that basis, rather than trying to make a mechanism that responds in very, very complicated ways. Uh, so that's the solution. So ultimately I do think it is natural selection, but we need to find a place for conscious understanding and free will somehow as fundamental aspects of reality in order to make sense of the idea that consciousness evolved through natural selection. Okay, let's let's uh, tease that apart a little bit because the argument of why consciousness would have been selected for rather than mechanistic, uh, non-conscious or zombie-like behavior uh, is, is, is one that is, that's an argument that is actually used by materialists uh, to explain consciousness. Um, and, and that's controversial, even within the materialistic uh, community that, that, that believes that consciousness is purely uh, neurochemical and neurophysiological. Uh, that's an ar argument that's both sides and, and your view is, is a, a legitimate view. But that does not um, capture the fundamental aspect of consciousness that is there something beyond the the neurophysiology of of, of brains or uh, uh, st stimulus response systems that is needed and that of course gets into the whole hard problem of consciousness about how we have the phenomenal phenomenological experiences and your approach to panpsychism so it's a much bigger topic but I, I just want to put all those issues on the table and, and clearly distinguish the evolutionary approach to consciousness, uh, which uh, is, is a debatable point, uh, your point being certainly viable and perhaps right, it sounds right to me, uh, but it's also a challenge. But that argument is used against the idea that you need something more than than the physical world to explain consciousness, which is a whole other set of issues, uh, which I think is important in, in, in your whole argument. So give me a, a, a sense of the importance of consciousness in, in the flow of this argument. So with the, what is playing a big role here in the first instance is a commitment to, to free will of a quite radical kind. And not for the usual reasons. People usually go for free will because they care about moral responsibility. That's not something I'm particularly wound up about. But I think in order to explain why we evolved with conscious understanding rather than complicated mechanisms without consciousness, we need a fundamental place for free will in our understanding of the workings of the physical universe. Now, the, the big problem for me with standard beliefs in free will is that it normally involves something magical and mysterious popping up just when you get human beings. And then, and then human agency is radically different from the kind of causation we find in the inanimate world. So in the inanimate world, we have 
compulsion things compelling other things you know the billiard ball hits the other billiard ball it compels it to shoot away whereas somehow magically in the case of human agency um we have the i the, the capacity to act without prior causes just to freely act and that that's a really dualistic picture of things so what i explore in the book is a view i call panagentialism where the roots of agency the roots of rationality go right down to the level of fundamental physics and so we don't have this dualistic divided world we have basically free stuff stuff that has free will even at the level of particles and fields now the attraction of that is once we've got that in place i think all we need is natural selection because once you've got that in place natural selection has a motivation to give us genuine conscious understanding of the world because once we do that we'll be able to use our free will to respond to that conscious understanding and survive better and better and better and get more complicated so once we've got the panagentialism you just need you just need natural selection but without that i don't see how you get the evolution of consciousness okay critical point this is this is the one of the unique features of of your thinking and the book and i think very important the second point once you have that how evolution works that i think is an interesting, sophisticated point, but I don't think that's terribly controversial. Uh, panangentialism at the level of fundamental particles uh, is, uh, what is, what was David Lewis's famous line? You, it gives me the, incre the in incredulous stare or something when, when you, you hear something like that. And of course he had uh, uh, his, his, own, his own views on that, on modal realism and everything that's part Everything that is possible really exists on something. So he got an incredulous stare. Um, at least in the past, the idea of panangentialism, of uh, free will at the, at the particle level, would get that incredulous stare. Less so today. Uh, a lot to uh, to your uh, to your work and Galen Strawson and and uh, of course David Chalmers and other people. So it's it's a it's it's a it's a rich field and and certainly um an exciting one uh but i just want to point out that you know the incredulous there is is certainly part of the approach to pan panangentialism uh but it, it's an important part of the argument so let, let's move on again each day we're going to give you at each stage so we see how the logic progresses so we gave you fine tuning that led to purpose and now we have panangentialism where where uh, 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 the fundamental free will or or a proto consciousness exists at, 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 at uh, in, in all reality at the most fundamental level brought together and then evolution works its magic. So the next uh, part of your argument has to deal with how do you deal with it? Then this third part, this, uh, the, the, this purpose or teleology, which most people would have God being the, the solution there. And, and you don't want God because you, you uh, titled your chapters "Why the Omni God, God that's om, uh, omnipotent, all powerful, omniscient, all knowledgeable, uh, omnipresent, um, everywhere, all good, etc." Does probably doesn't exist, and your primary reason, and maybe your only reason, is the uh, the argument uh, from evil. So I want to ask you: Is your argument from evil against an Omni God uh, the logical um, uh, argument or the evidentiary argument? I'm glad you asked that because I think this is a, perhaps another thing in the book I do a bit differently. We, we're again often given this dichotomy. Either you're trying, the atheist is trying to prove that um, God is logically inconsistent with the evil or gratuitous suffering we find in the universe, or you're just saying something a bit weaker that it's some kind of evidence. And that's always generally construed as some kind of inductive inference. So we infer that uh, we can't think of a reason why God would allow suffering. So probably there isn't a reason why God would allow suffering. And so probably God doesn't exist. There's a sort of inductive inference there. Um, I, the, the, the way I spin it is kind of neither of those. I think God's existence is logically incompatible with the gratuitous suffering we find in the universe plus a very very plausible ethical proposition which i call the cosmic sin intuition this is the intuition that it would be immoral it would be immoral for an all-powerful being to create a universe like this 
with so much suffering in it. I think that is, I don't know for certain that that is true, but it seems to me a very plausible moral intuition, as plausible as any other moral intuition I might have. And once we have that in place, then we get a logical incompatibility, but you need that that moral proposition. In okay, I, I think that's definitely an advance. I like that. Uh, you quote uh, Alvin Plantinga, uh, and he said this on Closer to Truth some years ago, uh, you know, why would we expect God to tell a theist, much less you who are not a theist, why, you know, God's reason uh, for for evil? Uh, you know, would we expect the creator of the universe to give his secrets, even to those people who believe in him? This, in a way, interestingly connects with my critique of one response to fine tuning, which is that all we can do is work with the evidence we have. I give an analogy in the book talking about planting his view you just gave there, the thinking about dark matter and dark energy, a huge percentage of the universe. We don't know what the hell it is. Now, it could be that if you knew the real nature of the dark matter and the dark energy, it would change all our physics. But nobody thinks that means we can't do physics with the matter we do know about and we get on with it. Likewise, yeah, you know, maybe God does exist. Maybe from God's perspective, morality is a bit different and there are good reasons for hurricanes and cancer and all the rest of it. But all I can do is work with my best moral intuitions and the best moral intuitions of other philosophers and theorists. And to my mind, those moral intuitions seem to kind of I, I think on. that's right. I mean, I can make up reasons why God or whatever could do that. I mean, there could be a, a, I don't know, a meta metaphysical law that says only those who suffer can attain life after death. And that's sort of fixed into the maybe a necessity law. I mean, I can make something up like that. Uh, but your approach that, you know, we work with the evidence we have uh, and, and putting that uh, moral uh, node in or half node in the middle, I think is an, is, is an interesting uh um, advance of that of that argument. All right, let's move on to, okay, now we've eliminated God. Um, we, we did it pretty quickly, so that's good. Um, and so now uh, your, your approach is the cosmic purpose, because we had purpose through fine tuning and then consciousness uh, and, and panangentialism. And now we've eliminated gods, but still have that third category. So we have, which is purpose or teleology. And so now what are, uh, are, are the possibilities that you would have in that category and just go through each you have three non-standard designers teleological laws and then uh cosmo psychism so deal with the first two quickly and then we're going to focus on uh cosmo psychism good so perhaps the most straightforward way of of getting around this is to tweak the properties of god a little bit so instead of having this omni god who's all knowing all powerful perfectly good Maybe you've got a bad God or a, a or an amoral God or a God of limited abilities who's made the best universe you can. Or maybe the simulation hypothesis that maybe the, maybe the cosmic designer is just a random software engineer in the next universe up and we're living in the computer simulation. So that's what that's one the ability. The latter really doesn't solve any problems. That just kicks it up a level. The the, the earlier ones do. Uh, but simulation on people say that, but but really that's that doesn't mean anything because you can then ask the same sort of questions at that level. I agree. I agree. Actually, I I mean I I have criticisms with with all of the options I've just said and <laughs> something along those lines for for the simulation hypothesis. But I think all of these things are worth thinking about. Um, but it's not obvious that we need a conscious mind to undergird cosmic purpose. Thomas Nagel has, in his book, Mind and Cosmos from 2012, laid out a very detailed account of what he calls teleological laws. So again, telos being from the Greek for purpose, laws of nature with goals built into them. So it might just be a fundamental impersonal drive of the universe towards life, a drive which interacts with the more familiar laws of physics in ways we perhaps don't understand too well as yet. Okay, so um, that's the second one. And now, uh, give an overview of cosmopsychism um, and how you come to that, that the universe itself is a, uh, a conscious mind with 
with purposes in some sense uh, uh, of its own. And then we're going to go into some detailed questions about cosmopsychism. But give us an overview of what of what that is. So I think there's something good about each of the the first two hypotheses we considered. What's nice about the supernatural designer hypotheses is they give you a deeper level of explanation. You don't just take purpose as a brute fact. You give a deeper level of explanation in terms of the purposes of the designer. But what's bad about supernatural designer hypotheses is a question of parsimony. As philosophers and scientists, we try to respect Occam's razor. We try to have the most simple parsimonious hypothesis. Postulating a universe and a supernatural designer is not great in that regard. So I think cosmopsychism maybe gets you the best of both worlds. So this is the idea that the universe itself is a conscious mind with its own goals and and we ground cosmic purpose in the goals of the conscious universe. And I try to suggest that this is not as extravagant a hypothesis as you might at first think. And you develop it uh, in the context of this book, but you've also really independently come to this uh, from your work in in uh, in on consciousness and development of, of panpsychism in a very sophisticated ways and all the different varieties of panpsychism. One of which, uh, perhaps the most extravagant of which, is cosmo psychism. Uh, but you've developed that independently. You're not. It's not not just something you're making up in this context in order to solve the purpose without God uh, uh, issue. It's something that you've developed independently that now can seem to be an answer here as well. This has been the, the main focus of my previous research. And in the last decade or so, it's extraordinary. Panpsychism has gone from a view that's laughed at insofar as it was thought about at all to being a mainstream, credible, still a minority option, but but uh, one that's published on taught to our undergraduates. And a lot of this is due to the rediscovery of very important work from Bertrand Russell from the 1920s. And Russell at this time was thinking really hard about the fact that physics is purely mathematical, something we take for granted and something which is very useful for scientists. But what does it mean as for a philosopher interested in the fundamental nature of reality, that our most basic science is just a bunch of equations. And what Russell realized is that it means, actually, physics isn't really telling us that much about the fundamental nature of reality. It's merely describing its mathematical structure. As far as physics is concerned, fundamental reality could turn out to be anything, as long as it has the right mathematical structure, you're going to be able to get physics out of that. It's like Stephen Hawking said on the last page of A Brief History of Time, even final fi final physics will be just a set of rules and equations. It won't tell us what breathes fire into the equations and makes a universe for them to describe. Okay, so so we've got this sort of gap in our fundamental story of reality. We can put anything we want down there as long as it has the right mathematical structure. So one option is we put a very, very complicated conscious mind down there that has in its conscious experience a very complicated mathematical structure. And then the thought is that mathematical structure just is what we call physics. It's, it's consciousness that breathes fire into the equations. And that makes it, obviously you'd have to ask what's the motivation for that. I think there's independent motivations in terms of solving the hard problem of consciousness, in terms of undergirding cosmic purpose. But the great thing is it's it ends up being a wonderfully parsimonious theory of reality. Because I would argue there must be something undergirding the maths, or the math, as you Americans say. Um, I would say a conscious mind is is as as good as parsimonious a proposal as anything else, even though it feels a bit weird. Okay, so now let's deal with uh, just some questions about uh, cosmopsychism. And the first one, uh, just very... Uh, very precisely, why is what is the reasons why cosmopsychism is better than God in order to uh, uh, so solve that third category of teleology? I think there are two reasons. The most important for me, as we've discussed, 
is the problem of evil. Okay. I think, to my mind, it makes no sense that a loving, all-powerful being would create a universe like okay. this. Yeah, but cosmos, cosmopsychism, as I develop it, we're not talking about an all-powerful conscious universe. We're talking about a conscious universe that is highly constrained in what it's able to do. And on this view, what physics is, is essentially a record of the limitations, the constraints of the conscious universe. So that's how the laws of physics come out are on this view I'm developing. And it's essentially those limitations that are recorded by the laws of physics that account for the terrible gratuitous suffering we find in the world. And, and I think you make the argument that uh, it, it is in a sense not supernatural and therefore yeah. you don't have to take that extra step and build some new reality out there. You just deal with the single reality that, that we have. So yeah. in, in sense, that's, that's that's the second reason. Yes, it's wonderfully parsimonious. We don't need anything. We don't need something supernatural outside of the universe. We just have the universe and this layer of consciousness that underlies the physics. Okay, uh, next question is, uh, articulate uh, cosmopsychism versus pantheism, which is that the universe is God, not in some metaphoric sense, but in some literal sense. So so um, it, 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 it seems that uh, uh, if I would try to articulate the two, it seems like pantheism in its broader sense is a superset and cosmopsychism would be a subset in that all cosmopsychism, any kind of cosmopsychism would be a kind of pantheism, but certainly not all pantheisms would be a, 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 a cosmopsychism. I'm trying to articulate those two uh, radically different ways or, or maybe very similar ways of looking at the universe. That's an, that's an interesting way of thinking about it. Um, yeah, in my academic work on explaining fine tuning in, in terms of cosmopsychism the reviewer said you know you've got to add an appendix saying um is this god or not and here we do get into difficult terminological issues i guess i would be more inclined to use the g word if this is an entity that has a great significance or a great relevance to us or if it's an entity we're going to worship in some sense i mean you could accept all i've said so far about this conscious universe undergirding fine tuning and so on but think, I don't care about that. That's, you know, who who gives anything about that? I'm just going to get on with my life. It, it's a further question what this means for human existence. If, if after hearing about this view, after accepting this view, you're going to get down on your knees and worship this thing, okay, maybe you want to call it a kind of pantheism then. Like many people don't think the universe is conscious, just think the universe is as the standard scientific per scientific picture would suggest, but still think of themselves as having a worshipful attitude towards the universe. And they're sometimes called naturalistic pantheists. So I think I, I would more want to connect that to, to whether we have an attitude of worship towards this thing, which is not necessarily something I'm committed to. So so that's really interesting. I, I really like kind of uh, articulating uh, cosmopsychism with pantheism because it, it gives a richer understanding of both, frankly, uh, two different ways of thinking about similar but not identical uh, uh, concepts. Um, it, it sounds like, at least superficially, cosmopsychism would be sort of in between or than, than a purely naturalistic pantheism pantheism, which is almost uh, becomes metaphor as opposed to ontology, uh, and a full-blown pantheism where you'd go out and worship that. Um, so those are, those are two extremes where, where cosmopsychism, because it is, it, it has a consciousness to it, uh, it seems um, uh, kind of in between that. Yeah, that might be, that might be a good way to put it. And, and of course, this isn't a perfect being. So a lot of people define God the way Anselm did as the greatest conceivable being. Um, and this, I don't think the, uni the conscious universe I'm talking about is, is the greatest conceivable being. It's limited in all sorts of ways. It doesn't necessarily last forever. Uh, that's no commitment of the book. Uh, maybe it'll come to a climax and then pass out of existence. So there are many ways in which this isn't the perfect being that we traditionally associate with the with the g word 
Yeah, I, I, I like that. Uh, I like that distinction. And also, I think you make the point, which is an important one, that uh, an overview that, in your view, cosmopsychism is the simplest way to explain all the data points that we're dealing with. Um, That's the hope. You, you know, I think, you know, I. Einstein supposedly said it's a paraphrase. He really didn't say this quite this way, but you make explanations as simple as possible, but not simpler. So simple is good, but that doesn't mean you have to be the most simple. Uh, but normally that's, that's, that's very useful. Yeah, it's a good way of putting it. Yeah. So my, my simple position is I think, uh, the, the theist can't explain suffering. The atheist can't explain fine tuning and the emergence of the, the evolution of consciousness. Here's a hypothesis that can account for all of these different aspects of the universe as we find it. And, you know, I think we need to be wary of whether if, if we don't find this plausible, it's, it's more, it's a cultural reason or because it doesn't fit with the current worldview of how science is supposed to be <laughs> the idea we've got of it, or whether there really is some deeper problematic problem with the argument or so on. I think we need to be really, really wary of that. I think an important point we need to make about your your theory and your approach is this this, this is not the effort of of materialistic scientists to sort of we make meaning for ourselves in a meaningless cosmos so, uh, because many physicists who are physicalists uh, feel that in order to make their explanation uh, 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 palpable for uh, humanity, they need to give back meaning in some way. And we, that's sort of a, we make meaning for ourselves. That's why I like Steven Weinberg, who was uh, brutal, but not, not happy that there was no purpose. But, you know, his famous line, the more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless. Uh, a, a view that he reaffirmed on Closer to Truth. And I, I kind of like that because it's very stark and it's not, mm -hmm. we make meaning for ourselves. You take the opposite view. Uh, Paul Davies, for example, said the universe is about something. Uh, you are very specific in what that about something is in terms of the teleology. So I, I, I think this is that clarification needs to be made. Yeah, I think. Well, I think Weinberg was right about physics for a long, long time. For over 100 years, it did look like a meaningless, purposeless universe. And I think that's why we've got in this mindset that science has ruled out anything like that. And then I think, in my view, slowly from the 70s, the evidence changes and it takes time for the culture to catch up. I like to quote the great economist Keynes when a journalist once said to him, you didn't used to think that. And he said, <laughs> well, when the facts change, I change my I change my mind. What do you do, sir? But that's <laughs> very hard for human beings to do. You know, mm. it's maybe a little bit like in the 16th century, we started to get evidence that we're not in the center of the universe and people struggled to accept that because it didn't fit with the picture of reality they'd got used to. And now we tend to scoff at them thinking, oh, those stupid religious people, why didn't they just follow the evidence? But every generation absorbs a worldview it can't see beyond. And I, I honestly think that's what's going on with fine tuning now. I think we're sort of a little bit in denial about it as a society because it didn't fit with how we expected science to turn out. But. So given that we have purpose in the universe, again, following your argument, um, purpose as you see it in this cosmopsychism uh, of vision, uh, it's still a little ambiguous to me in that there could be two kinds of purposes. I mean, they're not mutually exclusive. It could be both, either or neither. Um, one is that the, the universe itself has a purpose, uh, which may be eternal and static, or it can be unfolding and dynamic. And as you said, it could disappear. So but it's the universe itself. And the second that the elements in the universe, especially the conscious ones like us, have a purpose or purposes uh, because it's, we're in that kind of universe. That's a really nice distinction. And so, you know, most of the book is just this cold-blooded, rational argument appealing to philosophical considerations and contemporary cosmology that, that there is cosmic purpose, whether you care about it or not, right? But then the final chapter and the first chapter to an extent does explore the, the implications for human meaning and purpose. And here I take a, a kind of, I always go for the middle way between the two extremes. So okay. on the one hand, on one extreme, you have Christian philosophers like William Lane Craig who say, 
if there's no purpose to the universe, it's all pointless, all meaningless. We might have, he even says we might as well just kill each other or hurt each other. Not only religious philosophers, the antinatalist philosopher David Benatar thinks the cosmos is so pointless. We might as we ought, we morally ought to let the human race die out. It's immoral mm. to have children. Mm. At the other extreme, many humanists um, say, if whether or not there's cosmic purpose, it's it, it's just irrelevant. We make our own meaning. That's fine. Yeah. I take a kind of middle way. I think. I think we clearly can have deeply meaningful lives independent of cosmic purpose. If you live a life of kindness and pursuit of knowledge and creativity, you can have a meaningful life. But perhaps life is a little bit more meaningful, potentially, if there's cosmic purpose. You know, we, we want to make a difference in our lives. If you can, in some small way, contribute to the purposes of the whole of reality, that's about as 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 big a per bi that's about as big a difference as you can imagine making. So so that's my position really that we, we we can have we can have our own meaning independently of cosmic purpose, but perhaps and to some extent this is hoping beyond the evidence because we don't know whether cosmic purpose has anything to do with us. Um, Tim Mulgan has a wonderful book where he argues there is cosmic purpose, but it's nothing to do with human beings. We're just an accidental byproduct. He calls it ananthropic purposivism. So to some extent, I, I follow William James and thinking it's it's rationally acceptable to hope beyond the evidence. But I, I do think, and certainly I've found in my own case, that living in hope of a greater purpose that in some small way you can contribute to can be a, a deeply meaningful way of living your and, life. And that's, and that's where you move the book to and distinct, make it distinct in terms of, of where you're going beyond the evidence and, and hope. And that, that's fine. We, we, all have, we all have hope. Um, the, the, the next point, and let's do it briefly, is the relationship between uh, cosmopsychism and morality, because you do say in this context that you propose that we ground moral truth in the goal-directed nature of of reality itself due to cosmopsychism. It, it sounds like you're drifting into uh, axiarchism, the privileging of the value or the good that uh, uh, our, our buddy John Leslie uh, asserts, that the value or the good are the generative powers that brought about the whole universe. I don't think I would quite say that I ground value in the purposes of the universe. I think that would be a bit problematic. We'd come up against the classic used to throw objection to those who try right. to ground morality in God's commands. There's this classic thing, okay, is let's take the example, murder being wrong. Did God command us not to murder because murder is wrong or is murder wrong because God commanded us not to do it? Either way out of that dilemma is a bit problematic. If we say um, God commanded us not to murder because it's wrong, well, that seems to make morality independently of God, independent of God. But if we say, no, murder is wrong because God commanded us not to do it, well, then it seems like if God had commanded something different, if God had commanded us to go and kill, then that would have been okay. It seems to make morality somewhat arbitrary. I think the same problem would arise if we ground morality in, in, in the purposes of the universe. So I am a moral objectivist. I, I discuss this in the first chapter, I do think there are objective facts about good and bad and value. And part of my understanding of cosmic purpose is somehow those objective facts about value are playing a role in the evolution of the universe. Certain things are happening, like the fine tuning, because they are good. And that's obviously very mysterious. And you're totally right. That connects to John Leslie's axiarchism, which I already, I, which I also discuss. So, so there, there is, on my view, objective morality. It connects to cosmic purpose, but I wouldn't quite want to ground objective morality in cosmic purpose. Okay, uh, Philip. Finally, um, granting each of these points and, and granting uh, your uh, te teleological cosmopsychism, a conscious universe that has mind and purpose, as you've described it. Um, then the ultimate question: Where did it come from? Um, and we're not going to answer that. Uh, but what I'd like to do is uh, array 
the range of options that we have. And I don't know if we can make it exhaustive, but we can try. So let, let me throw some possibilities. Number one, you reject is an, a, an omni god who created it that way. So you reject. So what do you, what is there left? Uh, it can be brute fact. It's there and that's all. Bertrand Russell's famous line about the universe. Uh, brute fact. Uh, necessary in some meta law uh, system, not necessary in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, fine tuning physics, but in some meta system that this whole thing is, is, is of necessity. Um, a third possibility is some kind of retro causation, not backward among quantum histories. That's a theory that people would have. Uh, we talked about generated by value or the good and an uh, axiarchism. I mean, those are four so different. Are there any, any others? I just want to get all the possibilities, not to choose one, but just to get them all on the table. Wow. Well, I mean, this is one of the <laughs> deepest problems there is. So as you know, there are these arguments, cosmological arguments, they're called for the existence of God. And the idea is the starting point is there has to be something that somehow explains its own existence and thereby exists of necessity in order for there to be any kind of explanation of why there's something rather than nothing. So the idea is we've got this thing that explains its own existence and then that explains the existence of everything else. So that's the first stage of the cosmological argument. Then the second stage, theists try to show that this self-explaining being must have the, the characteristics of the traditional God. Well, I'm kind of quite sympathetic to the first stage of that argument, but I, it starts to get pretty implausible for me when it gets to the second stage. So yeah, it, it does seem to me there must be an explanation of why why all this stuff exists, why it is the way it is, and I can't see how you could how you could explain that without there being something that somehow has to exist. That if you if you understood its nature, you'd just say, "Oh yeah, that has to exist." Um, now we have no comprehension of such of such a being. We can't in our puny minds can't make sense of the idea of something that explains its own existence but there's no contradiction in the idea so so it seems a, a possibility of postulating such a thing even if we don't understand it maybe it's like you know dogs can't understand mathematics right maybe we just can't get our heads around the idea of something that it could explain its own existence but crucially i don't see why that even if we do postulate something that ex explains its own existence, a self-explainer. I don't see why that couldn't just be the universe itself or the, or the quantum vacuum. Um, you know, this doesn't show up in physics, but as I've said, physics is just interested in the mathematical structure. Maybe the universe itself that underlies the mathematical structure somehow has a nature that explains its own existence. We don't know how, but that seems to me a possibility. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat sympathetic to the theist line, except when they say, oh, it must be God. I don't, I don't buy that last bit. Why is there something rather than nothing is one of our prime themes of Closer to Truth. So I'm with you on all of that. I, I would only say, though, that if the um, necessary existence uh, is the, the, the essence and the existence are the same, uh, then what you're talking about, if, if that's cosmopsychism or the universe, then that could not go out of existence by definition. Ah, uh, good point. You got me there. You got me there. Yeah, well, this is, I mean, this is not something I'm totally certain of. It's something I'm open-minded on in the book. So I guess what I was saying was the the basic cosmopsychist view might not take the direction I've just laid out, but but you're right. It, if, if, if the universe exists by necessity, then it must exist in some form but maybe there could be some form that's that's um, that's radically different from the evolving spatio-temporal universe we we see right now. So maybe so, so some theists try to press. Well, that, the universe can't be the necessarily existing thing because the universe began to exist. So my response to that is well, the the spatio-temporal career of the universe started to exist, but maybe prior to the Big Bang, not temporarily prior, explanatorily prior, maybe prior to the Big Bang, the universe existed in some non-spatio-temporal form. Maybe something more like just the quantum vacuum.
Philip, this has just been terrific. Um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation on so many levels. I've looked forward to it for a long time. Uh, certainly has uh, met all of our expectations and, and more. I'm frustrated we can't continue longer. But in all seriousness, it's a terrific, thought-provoking book, Why the Purpose of the Universe, uh, a bracing challenge to conventional wisdom and an important part of our uh, of our discussions as uh, as human beings. Uh, viewers can watch dozens of videos on fine tuning, hundreds on meaning and purpose, and over a thousand videos on consciousness on the Closer to Truth website and Closer to Truth YouTube channel. Thanks everyone for watching. Philip, it's been great. I feel we're already old friends. Oh, thanks, Robert. I, I'm so glad you say that. I've just enjoyed Closer to Truth for so long, and it's it's wonderful to be a part of it. And thanks. It's been a, re a really stimulating conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing.